original system into a linear system and repeatedly solves that linear system of equations. The issue is that they don't create the same type of linear system and it looks, there are strong reasons why it looks that you can't apply the Tarjan algorithm to the Esparza et al. linear system. Uh, we found a way to do this, but as I hope to convey to you, this is a surprising result because a reasonable sounding sanity check suggests that it's just not possible. Okay, so in program analysis, we typically use iterative algorithms, such as Kleene iteration, which works up a lattice uh, uh, from the bottom element to find uh, a fixed point, to find the least fixed point, or if you use widening, a post-fixed point. The so-called Newtonian program analysis of Esparza, uh, Lutenberger, and Kiefer is based on the observation that numerical analysts also use iterative algorithms, but instead of anything like clean iteration, they use Newton's method. So I'll say a little bit more about this over the next few slides, but the high-level picture is that New Newtonian program analysis is actually very much like clean iteration, except that there's this added linear correction term. And the effect of the linear correction term is to allow you to skip up, to jump up in the lattice at a faster rate. Okay, to bring out the analogy, we'll use the semi-ring expression of data flow analysis problems. It's a little unfamiliar to some of you, but basically the join operation is gonna be written as a, as a plus in a circle, and the composition operation, or the abstract composition operation will be uh, written as a multiplication. But it's really just an abstraction of the composition of abstract transformers. This is the typical thing that you do in interprocedural data flow analysis. You're doing data flow analysis at the level of transformer values. So here's a program that I'll use as a running example. It does not have any loops. You can always extract loops out into tail recursion. Uh, so we do handle uh, uh, recursive programs. Uh, I'll say a little bit more about loops uh, at, at the end. So here's the equation system. So here's the program, the control flow graph, the equation system. Each sum end in the equation system corresponds to a path through the control flow graph. So here we have these, just these uh, three paths. It's, it's recursive because x2 is calling x2, which shows up as these two terms, capital X2 on the right of the equation system. Okay, so brief overview of Newton's method for calculus. So it's basically a method for finding roots, which is a little different than what we're doing, which is finding fixed points. But what it does is it, uh, uh, you, you, what you do is you take the tangent at the current point and use that as a way of finding the next uh, approximate and it zooms in on the root. So it re repeatedly performs this computation. But at a high level, what it's doing is it's creating a linear model of the function and using that to find a better approximation of the solution, okay? And the, the, uh, the uh, observation of Esparza et al. was that the same general idea, repeatedly create and solve a linear model, can be applied to programs too. So from fixed points to roots. Well, one, you might, you might start out by saying, okay, we can, turn it into, we can turn this fixed point problem into a root finding problem by subtracting, except that doesn't fly because we don't have a minus operation in data flow analysis. Then there's also the problem about this derivative. What the heck do we do about F prime? So that one is actually easily solvable. We don't take, we don't introduce any kind of limits as, as delta x approaches zero. We just finesse the derivative question by fiat. We define an operator that has the usual, the usual kind of rules and the uh, Newtonian iteration, iterates are created by setting up, using that uh, derivative operator, or really it's a differential operator, to set up this equation system. This is the linear model. I'll show you why it's linear in a second. And then that the least solution of this equation system is the value that you use on the next iteration. So that's the linear correction term. Okay, so on our running example, uh, here's the term that's quadratic. Let's move this over to the side. Apply the linearization operation. I'm changing the, val the variables from x to y just so to as a mnemonic that we're, we're dealing with the differentiated equations. That sort of corresponds to, to this program. It's a little bigger. Uh, it's got more paths in it. It's got some more terms because the, the differential introduced some, some extra terms. But the key, and, and also it makes use of the value, it has some uh, things where you have a y and a y, but these are small y's. And by that I mean it's the constant value, it's the value of capital Y2 from the previous Newton round. So for this round, it's just a constant value. The variables, which correspond to procedure calls, are shown in red, okay? But if you look at this, each sum end now only has one variable, 
that corresponds to each path having only one procedure call in it. Okay? So that's why it's linear. Okay. So now I have to confess, confess that this work got started due to a misconception on my part. I was listening to a presentation by Prathmesh Prabhu about the course project he'd done. He was reporting that Indeed, as Esparza et al. had said, there were very few root Newton rounds. It converged fast at that level, but a lot of time was being spent uh, on, the, on the solving the linear problems. And so I was thinking, okay, polynomial to linear is like going from interprocedural analysis to intraprocedural analysis. So on each Newton round, why can't we just use a fast intraprocedural analysis, such as Tarjan's path expression method? And what that is, that really relies on something you learned in formal language theory, that you can convert a finite state machine to a regular expression. What Tarjan said was, if you want to solve, want to solve for the data flow fact at a program point P, just find a regular expression for each point in the program, and then, to, then later you can evaluate it with some interpretation. These are the operators of the data flow analysis problem. The circle plus is implementing the, uh, is interpreting the plus of the regular expression, the circle times is implementing the concatenation operation of the regular expression, and then you need a star operator to implement star. That's sort of how you solve for, for loops in the data flow equations. The problem with this is that um, in, in our data flow analysis problems, our abstract, our, our, our times operation is abstracting composition of abstract transformers. And, and so it's like function composition, and that's not commutative, okay? So the reason in calculus the differential of x squared is, uh, uh, well, I've written it here as 2 y, capital Y times nu, uh, is because you were able to take the capital Y times nu plus, uh, sorry, capital Y times nu plus nu uh, times capital Y and turn it into Y times capital nu. Over here, we can't do that. We can't do this rewriting. And as a consequence of that, the terms, the linear terms that we get in the in the Newton transformation, you can't, we can't flip these values over to the right side or the left side to turn it into, uh, to expose that variable. Now, the reason we want to expose that variable is because if you think in formal language theoretic terms, that's going to give you something that is a right linear grammar or left linear grammar, which is, uh, which is a regular language. So if you think about this, uh, in, just in grammar theoretic terms, writing these symbols down from the equation as if they were grammar rules, what we've got is something very similar to the kinds of grammars where you have, uh, that produce languages like a to the i, b to the i, all right? That's simply this grammar here, x goes to a, x, b, or epsilon. And that's actually the canonical example of a linear context-free language. And the, and the, and the fact that a linear, the, the set of linear context-free languages is strictly larger than the set of regular languages, okay? That's the canonical example of a language that is not regular, and you learn that uh, as a simple consequence of the pumping lemma, which actually goes back to the Rabin and Scott uh, paper from 1959. So that suggests that we're barking up the wrong tree. We want to use, you know, it seems like we have a fundamental incompatibility. We're trying to do LCFL stuff with regular language technology. It turns out we aren't. It's a very interesting thing. We can sidestep this issue with some magic from algebra. The point is we're not working with words, we're working with interpretations of these symbols, and we get a chance to sort of finesse it by, by that means. So, the challenge is that we have to get matching quantities on both the left and right hand sides. We need a mirrored symmetry, a to the i, b to the i, okay? So, on a, in a regular language, we can only accumulate values on one side. So, one thing you could think of doing uh, is, to, is to put the values over on the, on the other side. We'll just uh, set up an algebra of pairs. So, where we used to have b times y2 here, We'll put that in the left half component of a pair on the right hand side of this term here. The C goes into the second component. And then this is an LCFL, and, and this is left recursive, so in some sense it's regular. Okay? So each variable occurrence is now leftmost in its sum end, so the system of equations is left linear. Okay, then we, we, need, a, we need to have an interpretation on pairs. And here you've seen that I've done things basically component wise for, for, for sum. Here, I've done something a little bit weird. I've reversed the order in the left-hand operand, and that's because I want to get this mirrored behavior, uh, this mirrored symmetry, okay? And then we're, we're going to need to take these pairs and turn them back into answers, and so that's what this readout operation does. And if we, if we apply that to this, you'll see that we, we do get the, the right kind of mirrored symmetry that we want. Out of this pair, when we apply readout, 
we get A1 match with B1 and A2 match with B2. So, so far things are looking good. And it seems to continue to look good. So suppose we think about following a path in the program or using equations from this equation system and connecting them up. So here we've used this sum end, then a recursive call that uses this sum end and a recursive call that uses this sum end. That's like following this path in the control flow graph through procedure calls. The corresponding uh, terms over here would lead to this path. We, we multiply those together and then do a readout and lo and behold, we get things coming out in exactly the right order. So this looks good, right? We've got the by2, that's here, and then this c over down here comes from that c, et cetera. All right, so, uh, but pair, pairing fails to deliver. Uh, even in this simple example, there are only two paths, uh, and what we want is a1, b1 plus a2, b2 is the answer, and the problem is if you do this pair, you get this, and then if you try and read out the answer from that, when you, when, you, when you resolve this multiplication, you get these cross terms. So it's conservative. We could use it for finding a sound data flow analysis answer, but it loses precision. So, okay, let's go back to this. Doesn't the pumping lemma imply that we just ought to forget about this? Uh, and, uh, uh, and as I said, the answer is, the answer is no. So there's a glimmer of hope here. And the reason is that pairing, we want to couple our values, the left-hand side of the variable and the thing on the right-hand side of the variable. But that coupling doesn't need to be pairing because pairing allows you to extract out each of the individual parts of the pair. We never need to do that. We just need to get this blended value, which is the product of A and B, out of the pair. That's what saves us, okay? So it turns out that we had used this uh, trick back in a paper about context-bounded analysis of concurrent uh, languages. Uh, in uh, 2008, we need this magic coupling operator. Forget about this little T for a second. But basically, it's, it's a kind of pairwise, uh, uh, if you put things together with this coupling operator, you, you get, the key thing is that you get this pairwise uh, uh, treatment, you get this pairwise distribution uh, over, uh, uh, to, so that you're doing multiplication of the, of the corresponding elements, okay? And then the other property that we need is that our readout operation has to distribute over the sum of these couples, okay? Such a construction does not create cross terms because of this uh, distributivity property. If we start with the thing that led to the, the problematic term, or something like the thing that led to the problematic term, we distribute the readout, and now we get just these two terms, and we, we avoid the cross terms, okay? Can we do this? We can do it, and we can do it for predicate abstraction, which is at the heart of most uh, software model checkers, okay? For predicate abstraction, the data flow transformers are square Boolean matrices. The composition operation is matrix multiplication, and uh, the, the join operation is pointwise or of the matrices, okay? And there's, a product, there's an operation called Kronecker product of square matrices, which has the desired property uh, that is a little obscured uh, by this uh, call out on the, on the slide, okay? So we're, for predicate abstraction, we can use the Kronecker product for, for our coupling operator. Uh, the readout operation, I'm not going to explain, but the bottom line is this. We can convert an LCFL linear system into a regular linear system, albeit at the cost of using larger matrices. I think that's pretty cool. Uh, I don't know if, I hope I've conveyed uh, my excitement about that. Now here's some intuition about Kronecker product. Well, first of all, what is it? If you have two matrices, the Kronecker product is uh, Basically, you're multiplying each element of the left by the whole matrix on the right. So it leads to a, a bigger matrix where the red lines here are showing uh, this A11 times B term up here. See, every, there's an A11 in each one of those blocks. Now, the reason this works is that when we do the readout, we're trying to get the product of A times B, which is this here, and every one of the constituents of the product is sitting there in the Kronecker product matrix, along with some along with some other things. So that's the, the danger, is that the cost of, of carrying around these, uh, these other elements of the Kronecker product matrix can, can have some additional costs. But that's why the algebraic magic works, is that we're carrying around the right stuff, and we can get our hands on it to filter down to the right answer that we want. Okay, uh, uh, there, were, there were these little T's in there. Uh, that's uh, what we're calling, in, in, in the abstract, and in the sort of general case, we're calling it transpose. And in the case of predicate abstraction with our Boolean matrices, it's matrix transpose, okay? So we just have the ordinary properties of matrix transpose, 
which is that if you take the transpose of a product, you flip the order of the transposes, okay? And that's why in our, in our, compo in our coupling operator, uh, these were transposed, because when we, when we multiply two coupled operators, two coupled values, uh, they, they, they associate, they, they get put together pointwise. So we have A1 transpose times A2 transpose in the first component, but now if you turn that into a transpose, it's A2 times A1 quantity transpose, okay? And now we're getting the, at least when we apply the readout, we're gonna get the, the, the mirrored symmetry, okay? See, everybody see how that works? Okay, so, um, so let's, so why does, this, why does this work? As we had with pairing, we now are gonna do the same thing. We're gonna put the, the coupled values on the right. We've got a left linear system. We can apply Targin, and the Targin algorithm turns, returns the desired value, the combine over all paths, okay? So our picture for, for the, that I showed for pairing, where we took a path and used these equations, well, this, this kind of thing worked for pairs, but it didn't work when we took the combine of a, of a collection of pairs and tried to do readout. That's when we got cross terms. But here, because readout distributes over plus, when we put together the, this kind of stuff for multiple paths, the readout distributes over it and we get the exact value with the mirrored symmetry that we want for every one of the paths. I mean, we're not gonna see the individual paths because they're all gonna be blended because of the, of the joins we're taking. But the value that we get out is, is going to be the, the, the desired uh, value with no loss of precision. Okay, so our story in a nutshell is we've got these two methods from 1981 for interprocedural problems, intraprocedural problems, this very interesting method to solve interprocedural problems. We've got this mismatch in what they uh, make use of, uh, but what we did for predicate abstraction, we found a way of converting this, gen this, this uh, linear LCFL system of equations to a left linear system. It's Kronecker products with, uh, of data flow transformers, then we can use Targin's algorithm on each round to find the answer. The answer is in Kronecker product form. It's a coupled value. To finish the round, we apply readout, and then without loss of precision, we get the value back that Esparza et al. Need. Okay, so how does this work? Well, there's good news and bad news. So here we take the Esparza method, Newtonian program analysis, and our method. Being in the upper triangle means that our method is better. It's better by a geometric mean, uh, so it's a uh, speed up factor of, of 1.62, so that's pretty good. The bad news is, if you just use chaotic iteration, it's actually way better than ours. So, that sort of leaves things open. Uh, you know, are there other improvements? Is it just a lousy, faulty implementation on our part? There's a very nice thing that's going on uh, behind us, but behind here, which had this one previous use from 2008. Because it's only my group that knows about this so far, uh, although I guess we have some readers of this other paper, because it, it, it has gotten some citations, I tried in the paper to articulate what I'm calling the tensor product principle. It's really something that, uh, that I, I think I first heard Akash Lal uh, articulate, which is that these tensor products allow computations to be rearranged in certain ways, and that that is advantageous for certain kinds of program analysis problems. I'll let you refer, uh, go back to the paper to read it. So for future work, we, um, we, want, we, we want to look at using this for other abstract domains. In fact, we know of one abstract domain where you can't do chaotic iteration uh, uh, for, for certain technical reasons, or you can't do chaotic iteration and preserve uh, the kind of information that we want to preserve. So that actually is pretty exciting because it means that we're going to be able to solve problems that currently there is no way of, of solving. Okay, so to wrap up, our goal was to combine Targent's method with Esparza's method. We had this obstacle. The chief technical challenge was, was this thing that looked impossible. How do, you, how do you make LCFL, how do you address an LCFL problem with regular language techniques? Uh, uh, and the answer is this little bit of algebraic magic. Uh, and the evaluation, thumbs up on the first one. It's, we, we did make an improvement in Newtonian program analysis. Uh, for predicate abstraction, chaotic iteration uh, turned out to be the method of choice overall. The paper has a couple of other uh, additional contributions, an alternative way to handle loops. We handle Cleany star directly, and also uh, merge functions for local variables. All right, so this is uh, the excursion we took, and with that, let me stop and uh, 
uh, I hope you enjoyed hearing about this, and let me stop and take questions. Really enjoyed this, Tom. Um, Fritz Engler, University of Copenhagen. Um, Tensor products have, uh, um, and actually also regular expressions have, have performance problems inherent. So uh, actually regular expressions are a almost uniquely bad way of representing regular languages. They are much more, uh, they, they can blow up uh, in comparison to, uh, you know, left linear or right linear uh, grammars. So uh, uh, Tarjan's algorithm, I think I recall, was mostly for on the tree with uh, you know structure control graphs, which where it works really well. So okay. I was wondering, reducible, pardon? Reducible graphs. Reducible, right? So that's exactly actually what makes it possible. You don't see the blow up. So if you have a situation where a flow up, uh, it don't do you see an effect of these things flow, uh, glow, grow, growing? And the second thing is the tensor product. If you normalize into matrices, also blows up, but it has very nice algebraic properties. Um, so that might be actually exploitable uh, and also avoiding the corresponding quadratic and in some cases even worse blow up. So the answer to the first question is quick. We, uh, we were not necessarily working with uh, reducible flow graphs. These were Boolean programs. These were the, hard, the 500 or so hardest uh, examples from the uh, static driver verifier collection of Boolean programs. We, we didn't see the regular expressions blowing out of proportion. Okay. Um, uh, with respect to the larger matrices, so our, our our matrices were all represented with uh, Boolean decision diagrams. And the thing about, the thing about uh, a tensor product with Boolean decision diagrams, it's just juxtaposition. You're just adding additional layers mm -hmm. in, the, in the BDD. So we're working with double height BDDs instead of single height BDDs. Okay, um, great, thanks. So you, I might have missed it, but the elements of the matrix that you said were just there do they have some meaning that you could use? Because it looked like there was a duality going on there. Uh, I'm not quite sure what you're referring to. So in predicate abstraction, a state vector is a, is a vector of predicates, and the transformer is the matrix that maps you from the pre-state vector to the post-state vector. So the meaning of an element in the matrix is uh, uh, really a, a column vector is what is mapping you, is what is how you're figuring out what the post-state bit is in a certain position in the post-state vector. Well, so, the, um, yeah, so it, actually the numbers are given in the paper. It, they are, um, I think on an average, it was something like, uh, it was less than four Newtonian rounds. And that includes the round that you have to have in order to know that things have stabilized. So it really is quite a small number of, of, of Newton rounds that you do. <laughs> 